Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. It is a wonderful crowd we have here tonight. I was told there are over 700 people. Yeah, I think this is a record. I'm not sure, but it certainly is uh, the most number of people I've seen here at this event. Welcome to the 39th Annual Heritage Toronto Awards presentation and the 17th William Kilbourne Memorial Lecture. My name is Mary Ito, and I'm from CBC Radio 1, the host of the weekend morning show, Fresh Air. Thank you. And it certainly is an honor and a great pleasure to be with you here again. I've done this for a few years now, and uh, it is always a privilege to be a part of this event because I love this city. I was born and raised here, and I know many of you love it too, and that's why we are here tonight. We are here to celebrate and honor the city builders among us. They are those people who have enriched our lives by weaving our past into our present in exceptionally rich ways. And this is something that really struck me this past weekend when I had Gail Lord, our keynote speaker this evening, she was on my show talking about how museums are evolving and staying relevant to people in their communities. And I thought, this is a good idea to ask listeners to email me and tell me about their favorite museum or the museum in their community and why it's important to them. And then I would share these emails with my listeners. I was so surprised at the tremendous response I received from cities and towns right across the province. People told me about that gem that we have right here in Toronto, the Enoch Turner Schoolhouse, uh, the Northern Ontario Railroad Museum in Sudbury, the Middleville and District Museum with its exhibit exploring the daily lives of First Nations people, the Personal Computer Museum in Brantford. Did you know? We, I'd never even heard of this. The Personal Computer Museum and even one woman told me about the sad demise of the Museum of Contraception in North York. <laughs> yes, and I've been there. It really did exist. It was a fascinating museum. There were so many, many more that I had never heard of. But what I also found interesting is that there were two common threads throughout a lot of these emails. One was how people felt these museums were more than heritage. They were more than history. They were an invaluable piece of their identity. And every artifact in their museums had a story about who they were. The other thing that struck me was how many listeners would say, do you know I've passed this museum so many, many times, and finally I decided to go in and see what it was all about, and I am so glad I did. How do we get people to notice museums and heritage centers and historic buildings and so forth? There are many, many attractions today that compete for our attention. I'm not sure what the answer to this is. I'm sure Gail has thoughts about this. But I could tell from these enthusiastic emails that opening that door to these places was so worth it. And these people wanted to share their experiences and their knowledge with everyone. And I guess that is also what we're doing tonight. So I am greatly looking forward to hearing this year's William Kilbourne Memorial Lecture delivered by our esteemed speaker, Gail Dexter Lord. She is co-founder and co-president of Lord Cultural Resources. And the lecture will be followed by the presentation of the 2013 Heritage Toronto Awards. Just before we begin our, begin our presentation, please help me now to welcome John Bellier, representing the Heritage Toronto Board. Thank you, Mary, and good evening. And on behalf of the Heritage Toronto Board of Directors, welcome here this evening. Every year we look forward to this evening when we get a chance to celebrate the city builders amongst us. Our theme tonight is Building Heritage with Innovation. A city built on change, Toronto is a centre of innovation with an international reputation. And it's an honour to have Gail Dexter Lord of Lord Cultural Resources, herself an agent of innovation in the heritage and cultural sectors, as our distinguished lecturer. This evening would not be possible without our partners. 
and supporters. And I'd like to uh, highlight a few of them for you this evening. First of all, our presenting sponsor, Woodcliffe Landmark Properties. And our nominee's reception sponsor, the Carpenters Union Local 27, and the Operative Plasterers and Cement Masons International Association Local 598. And of course, our media sponsor, Rogers Television. Others have also supported this evening's event. Their names are on the screen behind me. We're enormously grateful for all of them, many of whom return year after year to support these awards. They generous, their generosity means that we can continue to celebrate the ways in which our city's heritage and cultural resources inform and enrich our lives. Thank you to all our sponsors, and I think they all deserve a round of applause for Ms. Davis. Just a little, bit, a little bit about Heritage Toronto. Heritage Toronto is a charitable, arm's length agency of the City of Toronto that promotes a greater appreciation for the city's rich heritage. We have a small but mighty staff, all of whom contributed greatly to this evening's program. And I'd like to take this opportunity to acknowledge them individually. Of course, Karen Carter, our fearless leader and the executive director of, uh, of the agency. Dr. Gary Medima, who's our Chief Historian and Associate Director. Stacy. okay, they should get their moment. They should get their moment, yes. Stacy Fowler, who's Director of Marketing. Uh, Nancy Luno, who's our Program Coordinator, not just for tours, but also the awards, which includes this evening. Caitlin Rainwright, who's a program coordinator for our uh, very successful plaques and markers uh, organization. And of, and of course, Karen Sznicki, our administrator. And last but not least, Rachel Ostep, our marketing assistant. That's our mighty staff, but what really helps make this a great organization uh, is the data dedicated group of volunteers, actually we call it an army of volunteers at Heritage Toronto, many of whom are with us here tonight. And we're certainly very grateful for your time and commitment to our common work. So thank you to all our volunteers. <laughs> Members of the board are also volunteers. Uh, and tonight we're remembering one of, uh, one of them, uh, one of our board members, Daniel Farmer, who passed away shortly after last year's awards uh, evening. Uh, Daniel's uh, enthusiasm about the awards was contagious, and his spirit lives on with us uh, here tonight. So we thank da uh, Daniel, obviously, for his past contribution. <laughs> Working together is what we do best. We care about what you think, and this evening we'd like to encourage you to contribute to a collaborative map of heritage that you'll find in the lobby on this side. Look for it during the reception after the awards, and uh, we'd really encourage you to mark on that map um, those heritage places, things that mean something to you. So on behalf of the Board of Directors, I congratulate everyone here tonight who works tirelessly to build from this city's past, adding an innovative layer to Toronto's heritage with care and respect for those who have come before. Thank you. Thank you, John. It's now my pleasure to introduce this evening's presenting sponsor, Woodcliffe Landmark Properties. A leader in preserving our city's past and speaking on behalf of Woodcliffe is Michael Taylor. Good evening. Woodcliffe Landmark Properties is honored to be the presenting sponsor of the Heritage Toronto Awards, and I'm honored to represent them tonight from Taylor Smythe Architects as a longtime collaborator with Eve Lewis and the late Paul Oberman. This year's theme, Building Heritage with Innovation, has been at the core of Woodcliffe's corporate culture since the, since the company's inception when it was founded in 1996 by Paul. A visionary leader, he observed in his own inimitable way that I quote, if according to the old modernist prescription, form follows function, the fate of forms that have outlived their original function is unlikely to be promising. Paul's legacy was to demonstrate that significant heritage buildings can be restored and adaptively reused in a manner that's both economically viable and contributes to the urban landscape. 
Two particularly well-known Woodcliffe Adaptive Reuse projects that respect Toronto's past while bringing it into the future are the former North Toronto Station, which is now the Summerhill LCBO at 10 Scrivener Square, and the shops of Summerhill just south of Scrivener Square. Their most recent project is the redevelopment of the full block along Market Street from the south of, on the south, south of St. Lawrence Market, in which my team at Taylor Smythe Architects has had the pleasure of designing, working with heritage architects Goldsmith Borgel and Den Bosch and Finchley. This project includes the renovation and retrofitting of three heritage buildings, as well as the construction of a new landmark building that completes the corner of Market Street and the Esplanade, and contains cafes and restaurants that front on the generous outdoor patios along the entire block. This significant transformation of Market Street is a testament to the integrity and creativity on which Woodcliffe bases its principles. The new contemporary building and the way that it reinforces the scale and materials and, re and references them, and yet is distinctive from its older neighbors, is a prime example of Paul Oberman's vision that design matters most when it combines the old and the new, the historic and the modern, in the adaptive reuse of landmark buildings and the creation of livable, vibrant cities. On behalf of Woodcliffe Landmark Properties, we are very pleased to support the excellent work of Heritage Toronto as we all strive to make this city's heritage a vital part of contemporary city building initiatives. And we're very proud to support these awards which provide critical exposure and acclaim to all the nominees among us tonight. We're looking forward to this evening and encourage you all to continue to find innovative ways to both celebrate and adapt Toronto's historic fabric. Thank you very much. Thank you, Michael. Right now, I'd like to invite Councillor Gary Crawford, who also sits on the Heritage Toronto Board, uh, to come to the podium to bring greetings on behalf of the City of Toronto. Welcome, everybody, to the 39th Heritage Toronto Awards and the 17th William Kilborn Memorial Lecture. I'm pleased to bring greetings on behalf of the Mayor and all of Toronto City Council. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge a few of my colleagues that I have seen so far in here. Uh, Councillor Fragidakis, Councillor Vaughan, Councillor Ainsley, Councillor Doucette, and Councillor McConnell. I think I can speak for all of them that the, the role and the importance of heritage in, in this city is at top of our minds, uh, especially as we get into budget season, I think, in uh, the next couple of months. I was actually... I, John just realized I was on, on the budget committee and he was quite uh, pleased that he's sitting beside me, so we may be having us a few conversations. Heritage Toronto is a unique organization with an important mandate. It's an organization that works hard to tell Toronto stories in innovative ways. Stories have an inherent ability to change and make individuals understand. Stories allow individuals to better appreciate their surroundings so they can adapt, properly care for, and enlighten others on how best to work with one another towards a better future. As John mentioned tonight, Toronto is a city built on change. I'm very pleased to be here this evening and to pay tribute to some among us who have carried that legacy of innovation into the present day. Some have authored books or articles. Some have produced documentary films that tell Toronto's stories in compelling ways. And others have worked within their communities to launch new programs that aimed to ensure a balance between heritage preservation and building city efforts. On behalf of City Council, I offer my congratulations to all of the nominees and to thank Heritage Toronto for hosting such a wonderful evening. Thank you. Thanks, Gary. Heritage Toronto's distinguished annual lecture is named in memory of William Kilbourne. William was a rare combination of Ivy League scholar, social activist, politician, and historian. Born in Toronto in 1926, he later taught here, was elected to Toronto City Council, and served on Metro Council as well. 
William Kilbourne had an unwavering dedication to Toronto's cultural life, including its arts, heritage, and community service agencies. The William Kilbourne Memorial Lecture was launched in 1996 to pay tribute to this man's legacy and his tireless dedication to the city, and also as an ongoing commitment to his idea of Toronto as a viable, livable city that honors its past and plans for the future. We would like to acknowledge a number of Kilbourne family members who have joined us once again this evening, as they have for many years. Rosemary Kilbourne, Elizabeth Kilbourne, and Pippa Kilbourne. Welcome and thanks for coming again. And now I'd like to ask Elizabeth Kilbourne to come to the podium to introduce this year's William Kilbourne Memorial Lecture. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, all those people who make this possible. Two hundred projects, fifty countries, six continents, head office in Toronto, and offices in New York, Paris, Mumbai, and Beijing. Such is the reach and scope of Lord Cultural Resources. One of its partners, Gail Dexter Lord, is here to speak to us tonight. The other, Barry Lord, is in Italy, speaking in Roma Tre, the new university in Rome. Gail was born and bred in Toronto, and wherever she is, she will talk about the delights of her hometown. On a personal note, Barry, from Hamilton, was a student of William Kilbourne at McMaster University. And I remember Barry in our living room as he, Bill was giving a seminar there. And a very Toronto story. It involves the Toronto Star, which for many, many years, right from its inception, was one of the co-sponsors with Heritage uh, Toronto of this lecture. And so I'd like to thank them for that and to tell a story about it. It also involves uh, Robert Fulford, who gave the first William Kilburn Memorial Lecture in 1996. In 1960, Bob Fulford, who was then art critic for the Toronto Star, phoned me and said, I am going to be editor of Maclean's and have told Nathan Cohen to appoint you art critic, which he did. In 1966, Bob Fulford phoned Gail Dexter and said, I am going to Montreal to cover Expo, and I have told Nathan Cohen to appoint you art, art critic, which he did. <laughs> and it is most agreeable to me to share that connection with Gail. I heard Mary Ito and Gail Lord on the radio last Sunday talking about favorite museums, which Mary's already mentioned. My favorite museums were Damascus, in which there were artifacts from 3000 BCE, and the great museum of Cairo, filled with the glories of Egyptian culture. I wonder where all those marvelous treasures are now or the museum in Baghdad, so lovingly created by that intrepid Gertrude Bell, which was looted the day the Americans entered that city. I mourn those museums, and it makes the work of Lord Culture Resources even more important. If you are in New York this spring, you can hear Gail lecture at the Museum of Modern Art on Fifth Avenue. Meanwhile, happily, we have her here tonight. And so I'd like to present to you, and I'm very pleased and privileged to do so, to give the 2013 William Kilburn Memorial Lecture, Toronto's Ambassador for Cultural Throughout the World, the innovative and delightful and dynamic Gail Dexter Lord.
Well, thanks so much, Elizabeth. That, that introduction was <laughs> warm, overpowering, and wonderful. Um, it's a tremendous honor to be invited to speak on this happy occasion. And uh, Bill was an inspiration to me, and, and I think I speak for every one of my generation, whatever that generation is, I'm not going into that part. Um, and in particular, <laughs> to, to, to Barry, who, who studied medieval history with Bill. I mean, he had such huge breadth. You know, we think of him as a Canadian historian, but he's taught medieval history at, at McMaster. And Bill exemplified what today we call civic engagement. I don't think we had a name for it then, but that value of civic, thanks, that's a brilliant idea, thank you. I don't believe in those kind of bottles, by the way, it should be glass, but that's another story. Uh, <clears throat> but that value of civic engagement is what drives Heritage Toronto and drives all of you in this beautiful hall and all of us who work in the museum and cultural sector. And, 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 and Elizabeth, I really want to thank you for your comments on the situation of those great museums and great civilizations. It's, uh, well, it's the spirit of civic engagement that, that takes your mind there, and I thank you for it. Following a tradition that began last year with the historic presentation by Chief Brian Laforme, I'd like to acknowledge that we are settlers on the traditional lands of the Mississauga of the New Credit, and that we owe much to Indigenous Canadians, especially in Toronto, which is home to 80,000 Indigenous people. In line with the theme of tonight's event, I'm focusing my remarks on the theme of innovation and what heritage and museums have to do with it. Let's start with our beloved Toronto. Toronto has emerged as a major global city. We're all proud of this. Very different from the Toronto I grew up in, that's for sure. We continue to be among the top 10 cities in the world, among the top 10 cities in the world. That's huge in terms of quality of life. Now, I have to caution that there are almost as many surveys as there are cities, but this data is from the Economist Intelligence Unit, which is pretty respectable and not particularly liberal. Uh, it's me it measures green space, natural and cultural assets, connectivity and cleanliness, when we still rate high there, which is, uh, which is great. Toronto is actually number eight in the world, and it is the, and this is very significant, it is the only city in North America that makes it into the top ten. We take a deep breath around that one. Um, so this is for Toronto, right. All right, for those of us uh, kind of Anglophiles, uh, London did not make it on the top 10. And for us Francophiles, Paris does. So we're in good company there. Now, Toronto is 12th in a category called global competitiveness, which measures the business environment. Now, what's interesting is that American cities dominate that field, you know, so they're absent from the quality of life top 10, but they're very dominant in the top 10 of, of, uh, of the business environment. New York is number one, as you might expect. Washington, Boston, and Chicago uh, all surpass us. Um, we, we did the cultural plan for Chicago, and I can't think that it would surpass us culturally, but anyway, in terms of sheer economic power, it clearly still does. But in that context, number 12 position is really very, very good indeed. Toronto is number three in North America as an, as, quote, an appealing destination for international visitors. This is within North America after New York and LA, and we're actually the fastest growing of any city as international tourism destination uh, at a rate of 7% a year. So that's, that's a very positive future for international tourism. So far, so good. But there is a troubling result from a Toronto source, perhaps not surprising since we are always our own worst critics and that's probably why we're, why we're doing so well. The Martin Prosperity Institute at the University of Toronto has developed a methodology to rank international cities based on Richard Florida's three T's of economic development, technology, talent, and tolerance, okay? And then they've now added a fourth Q, which is quality of place. Now, in this very recent study, Toronto ranks a disappointing 26 out of 61 global cities. Our high points are public education, it says we're not spending enough, but we're at, at an A level. Um, the percentage of knowledge workers, we're the highest in North America in terms of the percentage of knowledge workers in, in, our, in, you know, in, labor, in our labor force here in Toronto. Tolerance and safety, we are absolutely through the roof. 
okay? Uh, um, they, good, like through the roof this way, not through the floor. All right, <laughs> and we get an A for heritage properties. Uh, there's 6,000 sites, and we get an A in the heritage category. But in this highly competitive world of global cities, and I think that can never rest on our laurels, and being Canadians, we never would anyway, so it's hardly need, I hardly need to talk about that. Um, it is our, it's very interesting what's pulling us down. I mean, 26 out of 61, I'm not happy with that. It's our, listen to this, it's our lack of bike paths, our aging infrastructure, inadequate public transit. It goes on. Right. This, this, is, this is the Martin Prosperity Institute speaking, not me. Lackluster performance on patents, maybe that's a little bit more serious. Although the economists among us might say that there's many elements of creativity that you just can't patent. So nonetheless, patents is a measurement, or patents, whichever, however you say it. And, and, and poor performance in venture capital. That, I think that's pretty interesting. And, and this is very interesting, weak financial support for smaller nonprofits. Those are the factors that pulled us down from the top 10. Without those factors, we would have been in the top 10 to what I call the upper middle. I am not going to list the cities that surpassed us. It really is too humiliating. I think that, <laughs> I, I, oh, you, can, you can go online, you'll see it all. Um, basically, this study says we are a great place to live, to create, to work, and to study but weakness in innovation can pose problems for the future. So we want to be future-oriented, and let's, let's look at some of this. But what's interesting is the question, what we're all here for, is what does heritage have to do with it? And you know, it turns out quite a lot. For one thing, creative people who start new businesses prefer to work in old buildings. They cluster in places like the Distillery District, 401 Richmond, 80 Spadina, and in the Center for Social Innovation, founded about 10 years ago. I don't know how many of you know the Center for Social Innovation, but there's a picture of it. There's the Bathurst Street location. The Center for Social Innovation is an incubator model. The 500 people working in three Toronto CSI buildings, one's on Spadina and, and one is, is in the Daniel Spectrum building, use shared workspaces, hot desks, and thrive on the free flow of ideas to create new ideas. Um, according to Tanya Sermon, CSI CSO, CEO, CSI CEO, we've got to work on that one, um, old buildings work for new ideas because people can relax in them and be authentic, right? Be authentic. She says, if you're not authentic, you can't create new ideas. And then she said, the voices of history are in the walls. So, I don't know, this is a picture of the kind of walls and maybe you think the voices of history. Um, now, the voices of history in the walls is not something you can patent, right? But it is an idea that you can export. So when a New York investor decided to redevelop the historic Scarlet Lehigh building, I'll just show you that building, uh, on the Hudson River, one of the largest commercial spaces in Manhattan, I think you can see how absolutely huge it is, he made a pilgrimage to CSI in Toronto to recruit CSI to operate 24,000 square feet of this building as an incubator for social entrepreneurs. In just a few months, CSI has attracted more than 130 New York social entrepreneurs to its unique eco-friendly um, space. So, yeah, I think, I think it's totally remarkable. I heard a similar story from the inspired coordinators of OCAD U's student gallery. Okay, again, um, building's not going to win any prizes. And this part of my, it's part of, part of my message, actually, is these new ideas, this kind of excitement and entrepreneurship, it happens in these kinds of spaces, right? Um, as well as in the magnificent spaces that we're going to be celebrating tonight. But it's important to think about the not distinguished spaces, too. Um, it's an old building, not very distinguished, but the art looks great, and the students love it. Art and design students are potential entrepreneurs. A remarkable percentage, I mean something like 90%, end up starting their own businesses. And this is just a picture of the interior. It's, it's the office where everybody kind of congregates in the office. They didn't actually have a good picture of the gallery, but the gallery is beautiful. So. Quote, this is from, from Carolyn or Vanessa, who I think are both here. There's a difference in energy. Students respond more to natural materials and natural light. They feel like they are connected to artistic heritage. It's romantic. Now this building is located beside a beautiful parking lot. 
Now, I always think, you know, the Joni Mitchell song, can't, actually, Toronto is the opposite. You know, we're always getting rid of our wonderful surface parking lots. So I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say it's paradise or anything, but there's a great mural on it and so on. It will soon be, anyway, this parking lot will soon be no more, like most of our surface parking lots. Um, and actually, Toronto is probably the only city in North America that has nice surface parking lots. If you've been to cities like St. Louis, you know that surface parking is probably the, the worst blight of those cities. However, this one will soon be torn down to make, or built up, depending on your perspective, uh, to make way for a large condo development. It's not a significant building, again, but it's one of thousands, the building that, you know, that that this little student thing is in. It's one of thousands, such as depicted in Full Frontal T.O., one of the nominee, nominee books tonight, that make our city so very human and hospitable to new ideas. This notion that new ideas need old buildings was famously expressed in 1961 by Jane Jacobs in her death, her famous Death and Life book. Her thinking was that people with new ideas couldn't afford new buildings. So inevitably, you needed affordable old buildings for people to take risks on starting new businesses based on innovative ideas. She firmly believed that there needs to be a balance of old buildings, refurbished buildings, and new buildings to ensure a diversity of economic activity and therefore diversity of people too. Now, new ideas today have to do also with different kinds of economics, the economics of co-working, the economics of green design, the economics of comf comfortable furniture and good coffee. They also have to do with public transit and bicycles. 99% of CSI tenants do not drive cars to work. And uh, that, that's, a, that's, again, a new culture is being born with this new generation of entrepreneurs. And there's the link between heritage and innovation. And it, it goes back, certainly, to Jane Jacobs, if not somewhat. I think, really, Jane Jacobs started us thinking in this way. Now, a couple thoughts. I think that the heritage movement really should focus on furniture as well as on the built form. I was really delighted. Um, that Mars, the innovative innovation space located in, in, of course, Toronto General Hospital, which you can see the old hospital, um, displays the desk of Frederick Banting, who won the Nobel Prize for discovering insulin. And it's incredibly inspiring to think, you know, that new technology, new ideas of Canada can be in the forefront, and we actually are in the forefront in many ways. Recently, heritage furniture was the subject of a public apology by our mayor which surely demonstrates the, um, the importance of furniture. Our city hall, which is a masterpiece of design that transformed Toronto to become what we are becoming, was furnished with modernist chairs, benches, and desks, including 30 chairs by the late Warren Plattner, um, which, are, which were in the members' lounge. Now, this picture, shows um, the replica chairs, the replica chairs, they're, they're, they're not quite the same as the original chairs, but the original chairs, you know, we have to look at this in context, the original chairs lasted for 50 years. Lasted for 50 years. So someone who the mayor has said is, quote, no longer here, close quote, replaced the worn chairs with replicas at a cost of $2,500 each. Which, which he felt was egregious, and on the surface perhaps it appears to be a bit expensive when you multiply by 30, but it is said to have been cheaper than repairing them. Now, the fact that we have a disappeared public servant over this issue should not scare us, it should not deter us from the importance of preserving not just our heritage buildings, but also the furnishings, which are very much part of the story of innovation. The interior spaces where people work and come up with ideas on how, for example, Toronto became the city that works is, is equally part of the story. And I know, especially with our libraries, many of our libraries, and I should just mention that Toronto Public Library System is considered to be the absolute best in North America, many of those libraries... <laughs> We're furnished with modernist furniture, and you know there is a tendency, you know, you get, to kind of get rid of it. It's very important that that 
that we, that we treasure those places where we actually work inside the buildings and we don't just walk past them, and both are important. Now, on the museum side, since I'm a museum or cultural planner, museums are most often the repositories for the contents of older buildings when their use has changed. And it always looks very sad to me. I'm sure you will agree that it is much more exciting to experience the furniture in the actual space for which it was designed than to see it isolated in a gallery. Banting's desk is really thrilling in the context of a 21st century place of innovation. And, and I think that spirit is something that we should, we should, we should try and, and continue and preserve. And it's very important to experience our city hall as the transformative space it was originally designed to be. I mean, as this building ages, it is such a beautiful building, we really need to make sure that what furniture remains is preserved and reused and celebrated. Um, well, thank you, thank you. Now, one of the most exciting aspects of the heritage world today is its transformation from a top-down to a grassroots approach. It used to be that the only heritage worth preserving, this is, you know, 50, 60 years ago, but still it's a point of change that we may not be recognizing, was the distinguished building with European, preferably English, stylistic qualities. Today, Heritage Toronto recognizes that it is the human stories that define heritage, and that one person's island of calm is another person's memory of discrimination and exclusion. The launch of Heritage Toronto's mapping website, which you're going to see a static version outside, but it is on the web, and if I can use it, you can use it, and we should all use it. I think it's a really good, really good idea. Um, gives everybody a chance to say what the city is, what in the city rather is meaningful to them. And this is especially important in Toronto, the world's most multicultural city where meanings of place and space are ever changing. Another way that old buildings nurture new ideas and new communities um, is to accept some of the innovative uses that the public invents for them. And um, this will demonstrate that a bit. London South Bank Centre is a masterpiece of, of post-war design. Um, but it turned out, or and, not but, and, it turned out to be a great place for skateboarders for the past three decades. Um, so that's why you see the skateboarders. I, I'm sure many of you have been and noticed, noticed this. Um, Jude Kelly, the CEO, has committed to maintaining a space for skateboarders um, as, as, the, as she expands the center and renovates the center. It's now an older building. Um, but she's created controversy by moving, moving the skateboarding place about 100 yards from its current location. Um, on the grounds, and her grounds are this, everyone should feel part of this cultural center. Arts institutions should validate the culture of all social groups. And this caused me um, to think that how many of us, I include myself, have designed public spaces or participated in the designing of public spaces specifically to discourage skateboarders and other subcultures that we just don't understand. And then we wonder why young people don't voluntarily participate in our cultural institutions. Life is a mirror, and if we don't respect their culture, it's highly likely they won't respect ours. And so I was very impressed by, by the approach that, that you took. Oh, thank you. Okay. So, or we, anyway, then the other thing that happens is that we ignore the places that matter to others, uh, you know, not because we feel uncomfortable, which maybe is this, this situation that I'm describing. It's, if you've been there, it's, you, you, people like me don't feel that comfortable there. But because the story has been erased, right, erasure is an issue. For example, there's a big conversation happening about the future of the area around Honest Ed's. Now, in the 1850s, that area was home to about 5,000 escaped slaves who could no longer be safe in, northern, in the northern U.S. states because of the fugitive slave law. And if, you know, there's been a recent two quite important movies that specifically deal with the, you know, we in Ontario actually abolished slavery, the slave trade, I should say, in 1793. So there, there had been a lot of, of, of escaped slaves coming, coming to what was then Upper Canada and also Lower Canada. But the point is, by in 1850, the Fugitive Slave Law made it pretty, so dangerous to be in those northern border states that there was a great inward migration of escaped slaves. 
And, um, and, and a lot set, settled around, a lot of people settled in what was then the heart of the city, around Enoch Turner Schoolhouse. I think that's quite well known. But also there was an even larger settlement on what would have been the outskirts, which is the area that we call Mervish Village. Now, coincidentally, a hundred years later, a house nearby, right near here, on the north side of Lenox Street, if you can picture that, was home to Contact Magazine, which was one of Canada's first publications de dedicated to the culture and politics of African Canadians. Now, when we ignore this heritage, and, and I would say that African Canadian heritage really has been ignored in our city, we are sending a message of exclusion to talented people who have so much to contribute to innovation. And I think at this stage, especially since this area is now being reconsidered and is a subject of planning, I think we have to believe that a plaque is not enough at this point. It would help, it would be enough. Now, thank you. Okay, so museums and heritage communities all over the world are starting to step up to these issues of exclusion and inclusion. In Johannesburg, uh, we worked with the development agency to transform this site. I, I don't know how much it can mean, but you can sort of see it's a big site, which is a former uh, historic fort which incarcerated Mahatma Gandhi and Nelson Mandela, but at different times. This is pre-Robin Island. Um, and it was transformed it into a place of celebration called Constitution Hill, a place that both celebrates the new South African Constitution and commemorates the suffering that occurred here as a result of colonialism and apartheid. This slide shows how an exhibition in one of the cells was designed by former prisoners working with professionals such as ourselves to evoke memory and hope. So again, coming to terms with places that have difficult histories. Now, you think, well, of course, South Africa is going to be full of places like that. But here in Toronto, we have a similarly innovative opportunity with Campbell House, which I think everybody will be familiar with. It was moved to the corner of Queen Weston University in 1972. It's the home, or was the home, of the first Chief Justice of Upper Canada. And it's now in the heart of what is known as the... Um, Justice Precinct, you know, there's a lot of there's courts around it, and also there's a number of memorials to justice and freedom of expression and so on. We're helping the Advocate Society to transform the house into a justice museum, which will interrogate the meaning of justice in our society and address such issues as wrongfully as the wrongfully convicted. One of the goals of the Advocate Society is to encourage young people to take up careers in the law and to educate all of us on our rights and responsibilities in Canadian law, since most of the law shows on TV are American, and we easily get very mixed up about what actually our rights are. And my response to this, I think it's a great small project, is at last there'll be a place to tell two very important stories. Uh, one is Hurricane Carter, which actually is a Bob Dylan song, but it, it's a story that ended happily in Toronto, and the more recent story of Adam Nobody. Now, museums and heritage places, we think about how do they really inspire innovation. They're what I call cultural accelerators, just like the accelerator in your car. By bringing together objects from different historical eras, from disparate places and diverse people, they speed up. You think of museums as slow places, but actually they're places that speed up our sense of time and place and stimulate our minds to create new meanings and innovative ideas. Interestingly, research shows that the internet functions in quite the opposite way. When you're working with the internet, it guides you sequentially from one idea to the next typically reinforcing our views and values rather than challenging them. Juxtapositions of old, not so old, and new in our neighborhoods can be surprising, disturbing, and thought-provoking. Sameness is the enemy of innovation. Diversity is its best friend. The success of Tate Modern in London, with whom we worked for a decade on visitor research, among other things, demonstrates the power of heritage space to stimulate innovation. It's a decommissioned power plant um, as a home for modern and contemporary art. And actually, there's nothing inherently new about that idea. Our power plant in Toronto was founded decades before. Maybe Nick Sirota came here and thought, power plant, that's a good idea. Um, but what is the new idea? What is the new idea has to do with this? Scale and multidisciplinarity. The new idea um, 
is really typified by this incredible industrial space, which is the former turbine hall, which is used for enormous art commissions like this Sun by Olafur Eliasson, which is a, uh, a sustainability-themed exhibition, I guess you'd say it that way. And yes, those are visitors lying on, this, on the concrete floor. At this scale, visitors become actors. The success of the Turbine Hall actually stimulated Paris to renovate two historic, if London's gonna have one, Paris will have two, and now London's gonna have another one, so, so it goes, uh, because uh, Tate's actually opening up the, uh, another area called the Tanks, which is even bigger, so there's kind of bigger is better kind of thing happening here. Um, but uh, to, to renovate two historic buildings to display the gigantic innovative ideas in art, the Grand Palais uh, in the center of town, and Saint Catra, which is a former city mortuary, they had a public mortuary, which is quite interesting. New York recently restored the 52nd Street Armory, we actually, this is actually a client of ours, to present enormous works that combine visual art and performance. And you can see in an historic space, an armory space, how you can do a lot, and, but you do things that are different than what you would do in other more, let's say, genteel or manicured spaces. Glasgow has the tramway, a refer which is a, which is a basically a, not not very much refurbished, just a, a just a, a kind of streetcar shed where you can use all kinds of materials that you just can't use in a professional gallery. And I'd say that Toronto lacks this important heritage building type. Uh, where large-scale art innovation can take place. But I'm, I'm hopeful that by showing these pictures, we're going to have a fantastic developer who's going to take up this cause, and in five years, we're going to see something uh, really marvelous emerging, because we certainly uh, would make a difference. Two years ago, we were challenged, new subject. Two years ago, we were challenged by the 37-year-old mayor of Florence uh, in Italy to find a new use for a Baroque building in the city's historic center. Uh, San Firenze is the name of the building. It had been used by the courts for the past 200 years, and now they were in the process of moving to new professional court buildings. You know, this is the big thing. You have to have computers and all kinds of uh, surveillance equipment and things that you just can't do that well in heritage buildings. And um, the ground rule that the mayor gave to this little project was it must not be a museum. Florence has too many museums. So this is the building, and Okay, these funny little things floating around are not part of the building. They're part of the kind of marketing campaign for the new uses of the building, and um, anyway, there you are. Um, anyway, we talked to people, especially young people, worked with a multidisciplinary team, including a fairly famous Italian architect, uh, Italo Rota, and, um, and we developed an innovative new use, a center for science, art, and new technology. Get it? S-A-N. So San Firenze just became remade as science, art, and new technology. It would provide leasable space for universities that want to establish programs in digital technology in this beautiful Renaissance city. In the ground floor oratory, which had been used as the main courtroom, there would be a maker space. Yeah, I don't know if you're up on this maker space, a place where people use technology and 3D printers and they, they make stuff and it's very popular. And in fact, our, our libraries are very much getting into that. And technology labs. We found interest from universities in China and India and um, the local community loved the idea. We're still waiting for the courts to move. <laughs> that reminds me. In Toronto, we're still waiting for the courts to move out of Old City Hall so we can have a museum that tells the Toronto stories um, that need to be told and becomes a cultural accelerator for creative... <laughs> for creative placemaking and innovative city building. The most multicultural city in the world needs this place to help us recover the past that has been erased so that we can continue city building together. Besides, if we don't have a city museum, what will become of this? <laughs> so that concludes my remarks. Thank you for your enthusiastic response. And uh, it's just been a pleasure. Thank you very much. Oh, Gail, Gail, just before you go, come on back, come on back. <laughs> I, I hear, I, that was... I hear the voice of Mary Ito. Yes. <laughs> that was absolutely oh, okay. fascinating, Gail. I, I mean, I'm sure 
well, we're all hanging on every word you said, and there was just so much oh, no. to absorb. It was too much. No, it was all good. It was all good. I just, I never it. thought of museums as being accelerators, mm -hmm. and the whole marriage of historic buildings and being generators of new ideas, authentic new ideas of uh, entrepreneurs. I mean, all that. It was just, it was fascinating. It was thank fascinating. You. Thank, well, thank you, you so much. So thank much. You. But just again, before you go. I, uh, I want to introduce uh, Patrick Forster. He is chair of Heritage Toronto's programming committee to the podium. He'd like to say a few words. Oh no, please stay. So Gail, <laughs> on behalf of Heritage Toronto and the board of directors, I'd like to thank you for the lecture this evening and offer you this small Hello. token of appreciation. Very good. Thank you. I think I like all it is. Thank, so you, thank very you very much. much. Thank you. It was a real honor. Appreciate it. Thank you.